From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Kearns, Johnny. Great Plains Garrity. Oh, hi, Ralph. Johnny, you're 52 years old. I am? Eight months ago, you married a lovely 27-year-old girl. Now I'm with you. A month later, you took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on a chief of police's salary. I did, huh? And who did I name as beneficiary? Your beautiful wife. Who else? So? So, three days ago, you were shot to death. Eh, I had a feeling it wasn't going to last. And 24 hours later, your wife files a claim on the policy. My friends tried to warn me she was fast. Well, there's the setup. What do you think? The same thing you probably do. In that case, you got just 56 minutes to catch the plane. The town is Greensport, Missouri. And watch yourself. What do you mean? From what I hear, Johnny... It's a wide-open town. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the open town matter. Item one, $84.60, transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greensport and taxi to the townhouse hotel. I was hoping for a chance to shower and change, look around long enough to get my bearings and then edge into the case gradually. But it didn't work out that way. The case was already there and waiting for me, right in the lobby of the hotel. All dressed up in a shiny black suit, squeaky black shoes, and a neater-than-neat little black bow tie. Oh, am I glad to see you, Mr. Dollar. Are you? Oh, indeed, yes, I am. I just breathed a great big sigh. Relief, you know, when I heard you tell the clerk your name. That's how I know you're you, you know. You mean there's been some doubt? But, of course, you'll want to know I'm me, so... I'll swear I had a card in one of these pockets. Well, uh, maybe you could just tell me who you are, Mr. Uh... Potzer, Averill P. Potzer. I ought to have a card, though, to make it more official. Oh, never mind. I believe you. I must have given them all away. Don't worry, though. I'll get some more printed and see that you have one before you leave. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Potzer. And now... Oh, wait, Mr. Dollar. You want to talk to me, of course. Will I? Yes. I'm the agent here for the Great Plains Guarantee Company. I'm the one that sold that policy to the fellow that's dead. Oh, so that's it. Of course. <laughs> he wasn't dead then, you understand. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Feeling pretty lively, as a matter of fact, but with a new young wife and all that. I imagine so. But now uh, just Mr. What... Dollar, you've got to do something about that woman. Oh? Oh, she's driving me crazy. She wants her money, she says. $50,000. And she seems to think I'm carrying it around in my pocket. She's uh, kind of anxious, huh? I'll tell you how anxious. Chief Blake was shot about two in the morning. And at three that afternoon, Marty, that's Mrs. Blake, was down at my office after a claim form. Yeah, I understand it was sent airmail special delivery. But she insisted on it. Made me take it straight to the post office as soon as she'd signed it. Pretty cold-blooded about it, huh? <laughs> Well, I've heard Marty Blake called a lot of different things in this town at different times, but never cold-blooded. <laughs> you follow me? I, uh, think I'm ahead of you. You know what I mean, all right, when you meet her. I can hardly wait. Man, oh, man, wow. <laughs> Item two, a dollar and fifteen cents taxi to the suburban home of Edgar Blake, former chief of police of Greensport, now deceased. On the strength of Potzer's description of the widow, I added a shave to the shower and change, and I hoped I looked a little fresher than I felt. The house was a rambling two-story job set back from the street. Well-kept shrubbery, nice lawn, quiet neighborhood, and plenty expensive. I wondered how Blake had been able to afford it. I was halfway up the walk when a man came out the front door. He wavered down the steps, then stopped and waited for me, rocking slightly on his heels. A copper. I can tell him a block away. You're a copper, right? Wrong. Private eye, maybe? No. Insurance investigator. Insurance. That's what I just asked her about. And you know what she did? Oh, threw you out, probably. Right. Said I was drunk. Oh, ridiculous. That's exactly what I said. Ridiculous, I told her. Ridiculous. But you know something? She was right, I am. No. I can hardly believe it. Well, it's a fact, though. At least a little bit. My name's Crayley. Joe Crayley. I'm a reporter. Greensport Daily Herald. Shiny Dollar. Hiya, Joe. Insurance, huh? And he did have some. Well, you wouldn't have had any reason to be here. She was lying. No comment. 
Who's the beneficiary? Uh, still no comment. It's her, of course. Little smarty Marty. His ever love a little wife. How much is she going to make on the deal? Uh, sorry, Joe. I... No comments. All right, let her lay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell me something, Joe. Uh, suppose I want a little action. Want to get into a poker game while I'm here. Find a craft table, maybe. Any idea where I could go? Sure. Anyone a half a dozen different... <laughs> How long have you been in town, Johnny? Mm, about an hour. You wised up pretty fast, didn't you? Well, I didn't know it was a secret. The town is wide open, isn't it? It is. But I wouldn't go around poking into things if I were you. A guy could get hurt, you see what I mean? Maybe a guy did get hurt. Blake, you mean? What makes you think so? Well, if somebody wanted to keep the rackets going, the police chief would be a natural target, wouldn't he? Not necessarily. Meaning? No comment. What was Blake's salary, Joe? Six thousand a year. On six thousand, he was living in a house like this. Wait till you see Marty. She's even more expensive. So that's why Greensport is wide open. The police chief was in. No comment. Mm. Well, he's out now, that's for sure. Uh, Joe, I'll probably be talking to you later. So... Yeah, yeah, do that. Just ask anybody. Joe Crayley, the alcoholic that works for the Herald. I'm always around somewhere. Well, how do you do? This is Blake. Yes, what can I do? Johnny for? Dollar. I'm representing the insurance company. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Come this way. I'm a little surprised, really. I hardly expected them to pay off so promptly. Well, in that case, you won't be too disappointed. Disappointed? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't come here to pay you anything. Then why did you come? I'm a special investigator, Mrs. Blake. What does that mean? The company would like a little more information about your husband's death. I told them all about it in the claim I sent to them. I know, but sometimes oh, it's necessary. Oh, that's the pitch. They're trying to squirm out of it. Why do you say that? Because they sent you here, that's why. And because they always do. I know how those companies operate. Well, you've had experience with them before. No, I haven't. But I'm a real smart girl, Mr. Dollar. And I know a fast shuffle when I see it coming. And a smart girl ought to know better than to yell before she's hurt. Why else would they send out a special investigator? I told you why. They want some more information. What information? What is it they want to know? The details, that's all. Exactly how your husband was killed. I told them all that in the claim. I know. He was look. shot to death with his own gun right here in his own house. Do you mind showing me how it happened? Oh, for the love of... Now, look, there won't be any payment until I file my report, Mrs. Blake. All right. You win. When you go after something, you really go after it, don't you? Well, that's what I get paid for. Oh. And what about something you personally wanted? Well, that would depend on how bad I wanted it. I see. Would you like a drink? No, 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 thanks. You won't mind if I have one. Right ahead. Looking at you. Right. Now, uh, if you wouldn't mind... Yeah, I know. Stick to business. All right, come on. Happened over here by the stairway. Mm -hmm. I see. Right here. This is where he fell. This is where he died. His gun was lying on the floor beside him. The middle of the night, wasn't it? About two in the morning, we'd been asleep. Why did he come downstairs? I heard a noise of some kind. It woke me up. I shook Ed and told him about it, and he came down to see what it was. He was armed? No. His gun was there on the hall table by the front door. Is that where he usually left it? Yes. Whenever he came home, he always took it off and put it there on the table. Then anyone who knew him would probably know they could find it there. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So, uh, what happened? Well, like I said, Ed went on downstairs, and I walked out of the bedroom into the hall. Were there any lights on? Well, not down here. I turned on the hall light upstairs. Did you hear your husband say anything? No, all I heard was the shots, four or five of them. Then I heard someone run out the front door. And what did you do? I called out to Ed, but he didn't answer. Then I ran downstairs and found him lying here, dead. Did you get a look at the prowler or whoever it was? No, it was too dark. And he ran out as soon as he fired the shot. How did he get into the house? The detective said he forced the lock on the front door. I guess that was the sound that woke me up. 
And then he used a gun that was inside the house that he may or may not have known was inside the house. That's what the police figure. All right. What do you figure, Mrs. Blake? The same thing, I guess. I don't know any more about it than they do. I thought you might have some theory of your own. I'll string along with them. Uh Uh-huh. Just an accidental prowler who got panicky and snatched up a gun that happened to be lying around handy. I guess that's about it. Any idea at all who the prowler might have been? Of course not. Do you suppose it could have been somebody besides a prowler? Somebody who came here for the express purpose of murdering your husband? Oh. And had a lot of enemies, of course, because of his job. What about his friends, Mrs. Blake? What do you mean? Do you suppose one of his friends could have done it? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been admiring your watch. Hmm, real nice. Set in diamonds, emerald band. Must be worth around $2,000. Very nice. Well, thank you. And this house, the furniture, that car out there in the driveway. On a police chief's salary, Mrs. Blake. I... I wouldn't know anything about Ed's financial affairs. Who runs the rackets here in Greensport? What rackets, Mr. Dollar? Was your husband in on them? Sure you won't have that drink? All right, Mrs. Blake, play it your way. I thought the insurance company was probably convinced that I was the one who killed him. They're not convinced of anything yet. But they think I did it, don't they? No, but they think 24 hours is pretty fast for a grief-stricken widow to shoot a claim into the office. I am not grief-stricken, Mr. Dollar. So I've noticed. Do I have to be? Is there some clause in the policy? No, you don't have to be. You think I did it, don't you? I think there's a strong chance you did. Then I think you need a little straightening out. I'll listen. Uh Uh-uh. Why should I make it easy for you? Go see Dave Sherman. Talk to him. Dave Sherman? The city attorney. See what he says before you get all lathered up. See if he thinks I'm guilty. All right, I will. And then we'll talk. And if you're nice enough to me, maybe I'll even cooperate. You never know. Do you? Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's very gratifying, gratifying encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Tomorrow, a smash in the teeth opens things up and an airtight alibi gets air-conditioned with bullets. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for...
Johnny Dollar. This is Dave Sherman, Mr. Dollar, city attorney. Oh, yes. I've been trying to reach you, Mr. Sherman. Yes, so my office tells me. It's the uh, Ed Blake case, I suppose. That's right. Well, I've already told my secretary to make all the records available. It's not the records I'm mainly interested in, Mr. Sherman. I want to talk to you personally. Oh, why? Because I've been informed that you're able to furnish an alibi for my number one suspect. Marty Blake, huh? That's right. Who informed you, Mr. Dollar? Marty Blake. Oh, the lovely widow herself. Right. Well, I guess we'd better have a talk. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes, if you're dead set on lighting a fuse in this town, I may as well give you some matches. Come on over to the courthouse. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri. To the Home Office, Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Items 5 and 6, 70 cents, a copy of the Greensport Daily Herald and the taxi fare to City Hall. I opened the paper and glanced over the headlines. Murder of police chief still unsolved. City Attorney's Office claims new evidence. Mayor Lyons demands action. I could feel for the mayor. My client stood to lose $50,000, life insurance payable to the dead police chief's widow, Marty Blake. So I wanted action, too. And I was hoping to get it from City Attorney Dave Sherman. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have a seat. Thanks. Why did you get in town? Oh, uh, early this afternoon. And you've already met Marty Blake. Well, that figures. Yes, it does. Under the circumstances, her husband has been killed. He carried $50,000 worth of insurance with my company. And Mrs. Blake filed her claim less than 24 hours after his death. So that's why you hot-footed it out here from Hartford, huh? Well, uh, the company figured 24 hours was pretty fast action for a grief-stricken widow. Oh? I don't imagine Marty is grieving too much. No, she's not. She told me that herself. Mm-hmm. Marty's about 26 or 7. Ed Blake was in his 50s. Uh-huh. Money, maybe? Well, not until he met her. Then he started to make it. Fast. He had to. That's how Marty likes things. Fast. And then he married her. Well, then she married him. Mm. And now, eight months later, she's a widow. With an insurance claim for $50,000. Well, she said she liked things fast. Why, uh... I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you may as well back up and start all over. You're off on the wrong foot. Oh, how do you mean? This killing. Oh, sure, it worked out perfect for her and made to order. A man could build a pretty good case against her, especially with that 24-hour insurance claim. Yes, that would really cinch it with a jury. I pointed that out to her. Uh I, I figured as much. Would you mind telling me what happened? Well, her first move was to start uh, turning on the charm. Well, that's one of the easiest things she does, if she thinks it might pay off. And after all, with fifty thousand dollars in the office, sure. You... Did she give you any of the details of, you know, of the uh, night it happened? It uh, bored her to death to even talk about it. Uh-huh. And you thought she was putting on an act to uh, maybe throw you off? What would you think? Oh, well, she wasn't, Mister Dollar, any more than she was sorry that Ed Blake was murdered. Then she's pretty cold-blooded. Well, that's a moot question. Figuratively, yes, I suppose she is. See, she used to be a dancer. Never good enough to make the big time, so she had to, well, live by her wits and her charm. But uh, you pointed out things that could look pretty black for her if the case ever got to court. That's right. Huh? What happened? She sent me to you. Why? So I could tell you she didn't kill him. Well, it adds up, Mr. Sherman. I know. It was late at night, the two of them alone in the house, her husband shot to death with his own gun. I know, Mr. Dollar, but not by her. Why not? That story about the mysterious prowler has been used before, over and over. Matter of fact, I broke one of them not six months ago. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's true. How do you know? Because you were wrong on one point. They weren't alone in the house. What do you mean? Who else was there? I was. Oh, I see. Mm Hmm. 
She's as pure as the driven snow. Well, at least so far as Blake's murder is concerned. Yeah, kind of a neat setup, isn't it? Huh? Instead of prosecuting attorney, you're the star witness for the defense. Mm, yes, I... I suppose if it came to that, I'd have to be. I was there when it happened. So that's why she sent me to you, so I could hear it straight from the horse's mouth. That's about it. Well, she couldn't have a much better alibi than the city attorney himself. Thank you. Well, she's in the clear, Mr. Dollar. How did you happen to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning? I was spending the night. Ed and I were planning to leave early on a fishing trip. Oh, I see. Like to tell me all about it? Certainly. Certainly we'd uh, all gone to bed around midnight... It was uh, oh, a few minutes before two I woke up. I heard Marty and Ed out in the hall just outside my room. I opened my door, and just then Marty snapped on the hall lights. A second later, the shots blasted downstairs, five quick ones. Where was she standing at the time? By the door of her room, not ten feet away from me. So you see, Mr. Dollar, she couldn't have done it. Uh, so that's that. She can thank her lucky stars you were there. Oh, Marty's always been lucky. Have you known her a long time? Three or four years, ever since she came here to Greensport. You and Blake were pretty good friends, I suppose, huh? No. No, as a matter of fact, we didn't have too much use for each other. Oh? Oh, I know it doesn't make sense, going fishing together and spending the night in his home, but... Well, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. Do you? Yes, you're thinking maybe I need an alibi as much as Marty does. Well, it is that kind of an alibi. It works equally well for either of you two. Yeah, only I don't need an alibi. Blake and I had our little differences, that's true, but they weren't serious enough to be a motive for killing him. Maybe Marty herself could be a motive. In what way? How old are you, Mr. Sherman? Thirty-three. Why? And Marty Blake is twenty-seven. And a beautiful girl. Her husband was around 52, I believe. <laughs> Wrong guess again, Mr. Dollar. I've known her too long, and what's more important, I know her too well. Meaning? Well, sure, she's a knockout. Uh, I was nuts about her once. She's a uh, uh, summer night, wild honeysuckle and a handful of stars. But there's one great big catch to it. And that is? She's got a built-in jukebox hidden way inside of her. And when you put in money, it plays real pretty music. When you don't, nothing. Ed Blake found out. And still went on putting in money? Yeah, he liked the music. And that's why he got mixed up in the rackets. Well, the police chief's salary was... Well, well, Mr. Dollar, you do get around, don't you? Was Blake running them or just taking orders? Now, what makes you think there are any rackets here? Maybe it was just a guess. Oh, who told you about them? <laughs> it's funny, I can't seem to remember at the moment. I just bet you can't. Suppose you answer my question, Mr. Sherman. Who's behind the rackets here in Greensport? Uh, just a minute. Who did Blake get his orders from? Or was he the one who gave you? Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Dollar. Just take it easy. I'll... Dave, I wonder if you'd mind going over that report on... Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't know you had... No, that's all right, Will. Come on in. This is Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, it's Mayor Lyons. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar's an insurance investigator, Will. He's here to look into Ed Blake's death. Terrible tragedy, Mr. Dollar. We'll appreciate all the help you can give us. Well, so far, Mayor, I'm afraid that doesn't amount to very much. The only theory I had just blew up in my face. Oh? What was his theory? Oh, Mr. Dollar suspected Marty Blake of the killing. Well, Dave, didn't you tell him that you... Yes, yes, he told me, Mayor. That's when it blew up in my face. Well, at various times in the past, Mrs. Blake might have been, um, as one might say, a bit indiscreet. But to consider her capable of cold-blooded murder is utterly unthinkable, sir. Particularly when she was standing just ten feet away from the city attorney at the time. Well, yes, that's true, of course. Just what is the official theory on the shooting, gentlemen? Well, at the moment, I'm afraid we haven't any. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. When we find Shorty Wells, we'll have the killer. Shorty Wells? A local hoodlum. Blake got him sent up the river a couple of years ago, and Shorty swore that he'd get Blake for it if it was the last thing that he ever did. Oh, well, now, that's a fairly common threat, though, for a criminal to make. Yeah, and usually it's nothing but talk. But Shorty was paroled just last week, Mr. Dollar. He was seen around town the morning before the killing. And we haven't been able to locate him since. I see. Wells did it all right. There's not the least doubt in the world. Yeah, it seems to add up, doesn't it? Yes, and we've got every available man on the lookout for him. But so far, no luck. There's not even a trace of him. Tell me something, Mayor. Would Marty Blake know anything about the rackets her husband was tied in with? Rackets? Why, that's the most preposterous well, thing I... Well, it's, it's no use. Mr. Dollar's been talking to somebody, and he's found out that our little city isn't as lily-white as we'd like to pretend. Indeed. It's true, isn't it, Mayor? As I hear it, Greensport is a wide-open town. 
May as well admit it, Will. He knows it already. There's no point in trying to lie about it. All right. It's true, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, but it's not wide open, as you put it. But there are rackets, as unpleasant as it may be to admit it. Do you have any idea who's back of them? I wish to heaven I did. What about you, Mr. Sherman? Well, if I had an idea strong enough to talk about, I'd be talking about it in court. What about this Shorty Wells? Was he in on them before Blake sent him to prison? Yes, supposedly, but he wouldn't spill a word about the setup at his trial. Afraid you, maybe, huh? Probably. Wells is the key to this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. The rackets as well as the killing. Find Shorty Wells, and we can wrap this thing up in ten minutes. Then I guess we'd better find him. Standard theory number two. An ex-convict with a grudge. Number one, young, pretty wife, middle-aged husband, big insurance policy hadn't panned out so well. And I wasn't too sold on the second one. It was just too pat somehow. And the fact that Shorty Wells was missing didn't mean much. If I were an ex-con just out of prison and had threatened a man who was later murdered, I'd be missing too. And yet the pan answer was sometimes the right one. Ah, the case was still like the town itself, wide open. I walked out of City Hall, started down the sidewalk toward the taxi stand. I didn't know what move to try next. Technically, of course, I was out of it. Since the beneficiary had an ironclad alibi, she'd get paid regardless of who actually did kill Blake. I didn't pay any attention to the horn the first time, but when it sounded again, I turned to look. She was parked at the curb a few yards away. Marty Blake. I've been waiting for you, Johnny. Have you? Yes. I want to talk to you. You didn't earlier. Well, I guess you just rubbed me the wrong way. You weren't very nice to me, you know. Sorry. You've talked to Bill Sherman, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He gives you an airtight alibi. Why didn't you tell me he was there that night when I talked with you this afternoon? I might have. If you'd been nicer to me. Oh, I see. You'd have checked it with him anyway. Yeah, I suppose I would have at that. Well, now that you know I'm not a murderess, maybe we can get to be friends, Johnny. You think so? You're still not being very nice. I am always politely respectful toward new widows, Mrs. Blake. At least until after the first week. I told you I didn't care about Ed. Who do you care about, besides yourself? Shorty Wells, by any chance? Shorty Wells? Who told you that? And you know him, huh? Of course I know him. As I used to know him. Where is he now? How should I know? What are you trying to pull if you think for one minute that you're... Get down, quick. Are you all right, Mrs. Blake? Yes, I guess so. They're shot. Johnny, somebody was trying to kill you. How do you know it was me they were shooting at? What? Maybe they were out to kill you, Mrs. Blake. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, an old flame and a new one, and two men get burned. One becomes an alcoholic, the other a human torch. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. How you making out, Johnny boy? Who is this? You disappoint me, Johnny. You ought to recognize the condition, if not the voice. Joe Crilly? Yeah, the drunken reporter on the Daily Arrow. I want to talk to you. Where are you? Oh, no, you don't. Not 
tonight. Why not? In ten minutes, you'd have me shoot my big mouth off. About the rackets here? And the murder of the honorable chief of police. And the peculiar morals of his lovely young wife. And Joe, listen. And L- last but not least, the ethical and philosophical problems of an intellectual lush... A reformed idealist who once or even twice Joe, tried... Joe, an hour ago in front of City Hall, somebody fired five shots at me. Joe, are you there? Beat it, Johnny. Grab a plane, train, bus, or walk, but get out now. When they put the finger on, it sticks. Greensport, boy, is a wide-open town. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri... To the home office, Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account continued. <music> Item 7, $1.85, taxi to the home of the mayor of Greensport, Will Lyons. I decided to go straight to headquarters, so to speak. Joe Crayley, professional reporter and semi-pro drunk, might have been able to help, but I didn't know where to find him. So far, I had a lot of questions, no answers. Police Chief Ed Blake had been shot to death in his own home with his own gun. His young widow, Marty, and City Attorney Dave Sherman had been present and both told the same story. Mysterious Prowler. Supposedly, the Prowler was Shorty Wells, an ex-convict with a grudge against the murdered chief. But Shorty was missing, and the case was at a standstill. So I went right to the top, to Mayor Land. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come right in. Thanks. My wife is going out this evening, committee meeting at the women's club. Uh, we can talk here in the library, if you don't mind. All right, fine. Take a chair there. <clears throat> yeah, well, Mr. Dollar, I will say it's a pleasure to see you safe and sound. Oh, you heard about the shooting, then? I heard the shots from my office. Then the acting chief of police phoned me a few minutes later. Well, does he know yet who did it? Uh, not the slightest. There were no witnesses, at least none who cared to talk. Car took off at high speed and then just disappeared. Like Shorty Wells. Fine. I sympathize with your feelings, Mr. Dollar. I'd feel the same way if I'd been made a target of. But you can rest assured, sir, that every facility of law enforcement in this town is working round the clock to bring the culprits to justice. Yeah, well, that's very comforting, Mayor. But actually, I'm not sure I was the target. What do you mean? Well, when I left you and Dave Sherman and came out onto the sidewalk, Marty Blake was waiting for me in her car parked at the curb. She'd been there about 20 minutes, she told me. Yes, but Whoever I Whoever fired see those shots had the setup plan worked out, and I don't think they could very well have planned it for me. Why not? My schedule wasn't predictable enough. They didn't know when I'd leave City Hall, whether I'd be alone or not, or what I'd do when I stepped outside. It's a point, all right. Marty, on the other hand, had been there for 20 minutes. Plenty of time to arrange the thing. But Why? Why should anyone want to kill her? Well, there you got me. I don't know. After the shooting, of course, I had a police officer assigned to guard duty at her home, but I regarded it as merely a routine precaution. I was certain that the attempt was made on your life, Mr. Dollar. Well, those bullets came too close to both of us for very much peace of mind. Well, at least Mrs. Blake has protection now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Unless that police officer himself knocks her off. Well, you, you're joking, of course. Mayor, that's the worst thing about this whole case. I don't know whether I'm joking or not. But surely you don't think... And you, are you certain of which ones you can trust in the attorney's office, the police force, in your own department even? Not entirely, no. Well, the rackets as wide open as they are here, some of the men around you are bound to be involved. I know, it stands to reason. Every raid we've ever attempted has been tipped off before we even got started. Blake tried while he was alive. Dave Sherman tried. I even organized two myself, told nobody about them, brought in state police to carry them out. Same result. Say, what about Blake? He must have been in with a mob to live on that lavish scale he did. I suppose so. Dave and I suspected him at times, but we could never turn up any actual evidence. Were he and the city attorney friends? 
Ed and Dave? <laughs> no, they couldn't get along at all. And yet, the night Blake was shot, Dave Sherman was staying overnight in his home. Yes, I know. I have thought myself it was a little odd. Dave says Blake had asked him to. Invited him to go on a fishing trip the next morning. <laughs> a fishing trip. And yet they couldn't get along. Why, well, no. I can't explain it any more than you can. Any chance Dave Sherman was the intended victim that night instead of Blake? I really don't see how, Mr. Dollar, in view of the circumstances. Blake was killed when he heard a prowler and went downstairs to investigate. No one could have expected Dave to do something like that. No, no, I guess not. It was just an idea. I've thought of all kinds of outlandish possibilities myself, but it always comes back to the same thing. Shorty Wells. Yeah, the ex-convict who swore he'd get Blake when he went to prison. He was paroled just the week before, Mr. Dollar, and he was seen in town the day before the killing. And nobody has found hide nor hair of him since. Yeah, yeah, it adds up all right. But somehow I still can't buy it. Maybe it just adds up a little too well. Three-fourths of the criminals who are sentenced make threats like that, but it's a rare one who carries it out. Rare, yes, but not unknown. Oh, true. I admit he's a strong possibility. But when I hit town this afternoon, I thought Marty Blake was a strong possibility. Until the city attorney himself came up with an airtight alibi for her. Why did you suspect her, Mr. Dollar? Insurance. A $50,000 policy on Blake's life. His wife's the beneficiary. Well, I don't imagine 50000 will last Mrs. Blake very long. Hey, tell me something, Mayor. Are she and Dave Sherman close friends? Well, at one time, yes. Uh, in fact, Dave was pretty serious about her. But after she married Blake last year, Dave turned against her completely. I see. I don't think he'd risk an alibi for her out of friendship, if that's what you're thinking. Oh, I don't know exactly what I'm thinking. Mostly I'm just guessing. <sighs> I've been doing that two years now, Mr. Dollar. Guessing, figuring, trying to spot the leader behind these rackets. Not knowing which officials I could trust. Mayor, is Dave Sherman one of those you can trust? I'm not sure. Good evening, Mrs. Blake. Well, this is a surprise. Come in, Johnny. Join the party. Thanks. Of course, I'm the party. There isn't anybody else. Except my watchdog sitting out there in front. Yeah, I saw him. Cute, isn't he? Oh, I didn't notice. I did. Think that's terrible, Johnny? A girl who's been a widow four days noticing another guy. Why not? You didn't care anything about your husband. That's right, I didn't. Here's to all husbands. May they rest in peace. He's a cute cop, all right. You know what? I asked him to come inside and have a drink with me. And he actually blushed and stammered. Now, wasn't that cute? Devastating. <laughs> Would you blush and stammer, Johnny? No, I'd take the drink. Which I will, by the way, if you don't mind. Here. Make me another one, too. All right. What's the reason for this one-woman celebration, Mrs. Blake? I said, what's I the... I heard you. And you can call me Marty if you want me to answer you. All right, Marty. Why the lonesome gal routine? It's not so lonesome now, Johnny. Oh. Here's your drink. Used to getting shot at. Shot at how, Marty? Like we were this afternoon? Or like your husband? Everybody can't be lucky. Maybe Ed just didn't live right. <laughs> well, he's not living anyway now. I'll bet you know how to live, Johnny. Oh, sure, sure. I got a system. Tell me about it. Well, the first thing I do is hook up with the rackets so I can buy my wife lots of expensive gifts. Why don't you lay off that stuff? Why don't you try being nice for a change? Well, that's not part of my system. But I didn't kill him. You know that now. So why don't you relax and be human? Oh, the last time I relaxed around you, I caught the breeze off of five bullets. You're breathing, aren't you? I might not be if they'd been after me instead of you. So you're still on that kick. Oh, it figures, Marty. I'm no threat to anybody, not yet. I don't know enough about this mess. And you're saying I do, I suppose. I think so. Now, who'd want to get you out of the way, Marty? To keep you from talking, maybe. Don't you ever give up. Oh, all right, tell me this. Did Dave Sherman really see that shooting? Or is he just giving you an alibi? Why don't you ask him? 
Or is he giving himself an alibi by any chance? You're crazy. Maybe. Where's Shorty Wells? What? I said, where is Shorty? I heard what you said. Well, then suppose you tell Get me. Get out. What are you so upset Get about? Get out of here right this minute. Get out or so. Help me off. Take the... it easy, Marnie. What's that cute cop going to think? I don't care what anybody thinks. You get out of here and get out fast. Item nine, $14.40. Drinks, tips, and transportation for a local expedition in plain and fancy pub crawling. I was looking for Joe Craley, disillusioned idealist and erstwhile reporter on the Greensport Daily Herald. I found him on my third martini. He was on his seventh. How, oh, Johnny? How'd you do it? To what? How'd you find me? Mm, called your paper. They gave me a list of your hangouts. I had four more to go. <laughs> the reputation is a wonderful thing. Keeps you from staying off the straight and narrow. He's looking at you. Right. Joe, mm. tell me about Marty. Tell you what about her? Everything you know. But for her, she's got an alibi. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. But you still won't give up. Well, she hates champagne, but she always orders it. Why? Because it costs more. I see. She's every man's dream, Johnny. A pink and gold doll in spangled tights. And she's a four-star tramp. She's an ex-dancer, isn't she? She's an ex-lot of things. Ex-girlfriend of Shorty Wells. Ex-girlfriend. Huh? Girlfriend of Shorty Wells? Sure. Ed Blake took her away from him. That's why Shorty threatened to kill him. Said Blake was framing him. Maybe he was. I don't know. Anything could have happened with the police they got in this town. Crooked? Is that what you're trying to say? Some of them are that. The rest of them are useless. Like that business with the gun. What gun? That Ed Blake was shot with. They found it lying beside his body, his own gun. They just assumed he'd shot it out with the killer. It was two days before they realized he'd been shot with that gun. That Blake hadn't used it, the killer had. Wait a minute. Do you think Shorty Wells and Marty could have planned the thing together? Johnny, I wouldn't put anything past that dame. Why do you hate her so much, Joe? Guess again, my friend. I don't hate her. I'm in love with her, always will be. Joe? Yeah, before she met Shorty Wells, she used to be my girl. <laughs> Gives you something to think about, doesn't it, Johnny? <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a man with a gun, desperate, faces a blazing inferno and gambles his life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello? Hello. Johnny? Yeah, who's calling? Hello? Hang on a second, Johnny. Look, what the devil... Is that you, Joe? Joe? Sorry to keep you waiting, Johnny. I was trying to get all the dope on another phone. What dope? 
And how did you sober up so fast? There's a big story breaking, boy, and lush or not, I'm still a reporter. Then go somewhere and report. I'm going to bed. You want to bet? Now, look, Joe. Nobody sleeps in Greensport, Johnny. It's a wide open town. Racket, shootings, a murdered police chief with a lovely widow. Sure, fine. So what's the big story? A fire, boy. House burning down. Flames 50 feet high. Three alarms. Put your clothes on and let's get going. You get going. The only big story I'll be interested in is when Marty Blake is charged with murder. Johnny, that's where the fire is. At Marty Blake's. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri, to the Home Office, Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account continued. (music) Item 10, a dollar and a half for a breakneck taxi ride to Marty Blake's home. Its location marked against the night sky by a pillar of flame visible for a mile. The fire didn't make sense, so it fit in nicely with the rest of the case. None of it made sense. Police Chief Ed Blake, Marty's middle-aged husband of eight months, had been shot to death in his own home with his own gun. And less than 24 hours later, Marty had filed claim on his $50,000 life insurance policy. She didn't love him and admitted it. Good case. Except for one thing. The city attorney himself was present at the time of the shooting and backed up Marty's story of a mysterious prowler, supposedly ex-convict Shorty Wells. But Shorty was missing, and the whole thing was just a little too convenient, too pat, especially in a wide-open town. Joe Crady was going to meet me at the fire, but I didn't see him around. The flames had taken a strong hold, and the whole outside of the house was blazing. The fireman couldn't do much except try to control it, keep it from spreading, and to hold back the crowds that had collected on the street and lawns. Well, how do you figure this one, Mr. Dollar? Among others present was City Attorney Dave Sherman. Well, you wanted to get things stirred up. Well, they seem to be stirred, all right. Were you here when this happened, Mr. Sherman? Nope. This time I'm not a witness for the defense. I arrived after the fire engine. Yeah? What about Marty? She's all right. She got out before it really caught. Sitting over there in my car. Then she was here when it started. Yeah. Alone? Well, so it seems. But there was a police officer on guard oh, earlier. I, I thought you meant alone in the house. Now, he was out here in front. First thing he knew, flames were breaking out of the windows, and then Marty came running out of the house. No one had arrived or left? Well, not that he saw. Well, you're still trying to tag her, huh? Oh, I'm trying to tag whoever is guilty. She figures, that's all. Not on the shooting? No. Oh, not with the alibi you've given her. Mr. Dollar, look. She was standing ten feet away from me in the second floor hall when Ed Blake was shot to death in the dark downstairs. Now, that is not an alibi. It is a fact. Oh, yeah, sure, I know. Unless, of course, I am lying. All right, are you? Why? For old times' sake, maybe. You were in love with her once, Mr. Sherman. Oh, I could name two dozen guys around this town who were once. Yeah. Shorty Wells, for instance. That's right. That's why Shorty threatened to kill Blake when Blake sent him to prison. He claimed he was being framed out of the way to give Blake a clear field. Go on. Shorty's a hoodlum. He was guilty as charged, all right. But Blake was in on the rackets, wasn't he? Well, it would seem that way. Then there's also Joe Crayley. Marty was his girl at one time, wasn't she? That's when he started drinking, when she threw him over. Why did she throw him over? For the usual reason. Somebody knew. Who? Well, (laughs) me, I thought. Took me three months to find out that I was running interference for Shorty Well. All right, so Joe Crayley took the drink. What did you take to, Mr. Sherman? Law enforcement. I set out to break the rackets in this town and get rid of hoodlums like Shorty Wells and all the rest of them. Yeah, but the rackets are still here. And I'm still trying, Dollar. Now, look, I want to get one thing very straight. What? Ed Blake's killing. It happened just exactly the way I told you. That story is true. Marty didn't do it. Maybe not. But she's in it some way. She's bound to be. Well, that's something I wouldn't know. Everywhere you turn in this case, you keep hearing about Marty Blake. Marty Blake. She's the one link that ties everything together. 
Well, maybe. That fire there, what's the story on that? Well, why don't you ask her? I left him standing there, staring into the fire. Staring into his own past, maybe. I didn't know. To me, he was still a puzzle, a question mark. And I didn't have the answer to him. Not a much else, in fact. If he was telling the truth, Marty Blake couldn't have killed her husband. And so far, at least, there was nothing to show he was lying. I pushed on through the crowd of spectators, the thrill-seekers, the morbidly curious followers of fire engines, and walked toward Sherman's car. Marty was sitting there alone, subdued for once and quiet. And she looked scared. Hello, Johnny. Get in and sit with me. All right. Just look at it. Isn't it terrible? Yeah, it is. It'd be worse if you were in it. Well, I was when it started. Just how did it start? I don't know. I think you were right, Johnny, about that shooting in front of the city hall. Oh? I think it was me they were after, not you. Now they've tried again. Possible. There's no other reason for burning down my home. Who do you mean by they, Marty? Who? I don't know. Whoever killed Ed, I guess. If you know, you'd better tell me while you still can. If somebody is out to get you, if that's what's behind all this, then they obviously mean business. I don't know, Johnny. I told you that. Well, how about a guess, then? Oh, maybe Shorty Wells. I don't know. Why? Why? The man he threatened is already dead. Why would he go after you? Maybe to get even. He told me he hated me when I broke off with him. It's just the kind of thing he'd think of doing. Or didn't you know he was in love with me once? Oh, I knew. I'm asking you, how did the fire start? I don't know, really. After you left this evening, I lay down on the sofa. I'd I'd been drinking, as you know, and I guess I just went to sleep anyway. No one else had been there after I left? No. Anyway, I woke up with smoke all around and flames and all. It was terrible, Johnny. I was just lucky I got out alive. You always were lucky, Marty. Joe, what are you doing here? How about it, Johnny? Are you glad I phoned or not? Oh, yeah, sure. Wouldn't have missed it for a million. Has she confessed yet? We can run a new headline on the extra if she has. I can do without any remarks from you, Joe. Sure you can, baby. You're doing fine, just as you are. Get away from here and leave me alone. Can't do it, baby. I'm assigned to cover the fire. Got to get all the angles. Human interest. That's you, baby. You are human, aren't you? You stupid fool. Financial angles, too. Got one there you might be interested in, Johnny. Did you know the house is heavily insured against fire? Yes, yes, I know, Joe. I checked through the company report before I left the hotel. Oh, what of it? What if it is? Most houses are insured against fire, aren't they? Sure they are, especially by prudent people like you. People who think of everything. Oh, take it easy, Joe. Get him away from here, Johnny. Only you didn't think of everything, baby. What? It's too bad your car wasn't in the garage instead of sitting out in the driveway. Then all your assets would have been converted into cash. Nice, green, bloody cash. Get away from here. Get away and leave me alone. Why, baby? You can afford me now. You couldn't a couple of years ago. That's why you're tied up with all the other... What the devil? They came from the house. Well, there couldn't be... Ammunition, maybe. Yeah, your husband must have kept boxes of cartridges hey, around look, the house. Look, there by the cellar door. Somebody's staggering up out of the basement. Johnny, look. He's got a gun in his hand. I can't He's be. fallen down on the ground. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Oh, man. When the dam breaks, everything goes. How could anybody come out of that thing alive? We Greensporters are tough cookies, Johnny. I'm lucky, apparently. He's passed out cold. Another minute and he wouldn't have made it. His clothes are smoldering there. Yeah. Let's turn him over and get that coat yeah, off. Right. Easy now. All right. Oh, good Lord. What's the matter? This is the boy everybody in town has been looking for. Shorty Wells. Room 604. Greensport City Hospital. Time midnight. The time when the pulse of living starts to slow down. The beginning of the quiet time. When the city sleeps and the nurses and interns walk even more softly. When a ticking clock becomes a drumbeat in the ears of restless patients. The time of crises when battles for life are fought in silence and won are lost. A battle like that was being fought in 604, witnessed at the moment by myself and city attorney Dave Sherman. Well, this is always the tough part, the slow part of waiting it out. Maybe a long wait, Mr. Sherman. 
Nearly three hours, and he still hasn't regained consciousness. You know, I can't understand where he's been hiding out since Blake was shot. Yeah, well, it's hard to tell. I've turned this town upside down, I tell you. I just can't understand it. Oh, I can't understand a lot of things. It's just another one of a lot of things about this case that are hard to figure out. Well, it's tied up with the rackets. That's what I'm sure of. I'm not sure of anything about this mess. Yes, if we could just tag the person behind them, we could wrap it up. If we get only... Oh, excuse me. I'll get it. Dave sure must be. Oh, yes, Mayor. Oh, Dr. Morton says he may hang on for a day or two, but as far as pulling through, he hasn't got much chance. Oh, he hasn't been conscious at all yet. Yes, I'll... Yes, I'll keep in touch. I'll let you know the minute there's an... All right, Mayor. Good night. Mayor Lyons, huh? Yeah. He's a real fuss budget sometimes. He ought to go to bed and talk. Wait a second. Hey, he's trying to talk. No. False alarm again. Dollar? Do you think he started that fire? Oh, I don't know. If he did, he got caught in his own trap. I just can't figure what he'd hope to gain by doing anything. Johnny. Dave. Hi. Has he been able to talk yet? Not yet, Joe. Get your story found? Just under the wire. Of course, it consisted mainly of questions. Well, Shorty Wells has the answers. If you were only able to give them out. I can't figure on firing those shots, Johnny. I can't either. He fired them before he came out of the blaze. He apparently wasn't trying to shoot anyone. He couldn't even see anyone the way he's burned. I'm afraid all we can do is wait. At least we'll know the whole story once he's able to talk. Suppose he never is able. Well, he's the only lead we've had. And he's the only one we've got now. The whole case is lying right there on that bed. If Shorty Wells dies without regaining consciousness, then we can drop it and forget it. Because we're beat. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, death strikes again, lashes out violently, and mistakes its target. And a wide-open town blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. It's me, Johnny. Marty? Yeah. How is he? All about the same. Dr. Morton just gave him another transfusion. Has he been able to say anything yet? He hasn't even been conscious. Why, Marty? Who's there with you? Joe Crayley and the city attorney. Look, Johnny, I've got to talk to you. Right away. All right. Go ahead and talk. No, not on the phone. All right, it's room 604, City Hospital. Come on over. Not with them there. Why don't you come meet me? 
Because Shorty Wells is the key to this whole case. If he's able to talk before he dies, I want to be here to listen. Suppose I tell you I'm ready to talk, Johnny. Are you telling me? I'm in an all-night lunchroom right across the street from the hospital. Can you come over here? All right, Marty. I'll gamble with you. Be there in five minutes. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri, to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account, final page. I hung up the phone more puzzled than ever, and heaven knows the case had been puzzling from the start. Marty Blake, young widow of the murdered police chief, had been completely uncooperative and unwilling to talk. And now she was reversing her field. Why? Her house had burned to the ground earlier in the evening, and Shorty Wells, number one on the city attorney's wanted-for-murder list, had been found trapped in the flames. Maybe this had something to do with Marty's phone call. She'd been my number one suspect at first, since she stood to collect $50,000 as beneficiary of her husband's life insurance. But then the city attorney himself, Dave Sherman, had provided her with an airtight alibi, and I'd reluctantly let her off the hook. Now this. I didn't know what she was up to, and I couldn't afford not to find out. Something up, Dolly? Well, that was Marty Blake, Mr. Sherman. She's in a lunchroom across the street. She wants to see me. Oh, what about? She didn't say. Well, go ahead and talk to her if you want to, Johnny. I'll call you if Shorty starts to regain consciousness. All right, thanks, Joe. I'm sticking right here myself. This one I'm going to follow personally. Well, if you really want to break the rackets in this town, your answer is lying right there on that bed, Shorty Wells. I think you're right, if he's ever able to talk. And if your police laddies don't fall over their own feet again, the way they did on that gun business when Ed Blake was shot. That mistake was partly justified, Joe. It was the chief's own gun that was lying beside his body. It was natural to assume that he'd exchanged shots with a prowler. Yeah, but two days to realize he'd been shot with his own gun. All right, all right. They fouled up, I admit it. And the ones who aren't stupid are crooked. Every raid you try to pull has been tipped off in the I inside. know it, I know it. Even when Mayor Lyons brought in state police, the whole plan was tipped. Which you took great pleasure in pointing out in your news right, story. All right, you guys, look now. I'll leave you two to settle this. Stick on this guy like a leech. And if he shows any sign of coming to and talking, let me know right away, will you? Yeah, we'll call you. Yeah. I'll see you later. Back here in the booth, Johnny. Right. Well, what's on your mind, Marty? Sit down, Johnny. Here, come on. Why not? Well? The waiter's in back if you'd like some coffee or something. No, thanks. Okay, now what is it? What is what? Well, you had to talk to me right away. How I talk? Johnny, I'm not... Too hard to take, am I? No, no, you're a pink and gold doll. Wild honeysuckle and a handful of stars. At least that's what a couple of guys said today. I don't care what a couple of guys said. What do you say, Johnny? I guess the description fits, as far as looks are concerned. And if that's all you want to talk about... No, no, wait, Johnny. I'm in the clear on this, you know that. The night my husband was killed, I've got an alibi nobody could shake, right? Well, I'm pretty well convinced you didn't pull the trigger, if that's what you mean. And you could convince the insurance company, too, couldn't you? If you would. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'd go pretty much in my report. But I don't see... Why don't we get this settled and over with? Why don't you be nice, Johnny? And turn in a real good report. Oh, so that's the pitch. Well, it's not a pitch. I didn't do it, so why can't you tell them so? Why don't we get some more answers first to a lot of questions? Explain a few odd angles, maybe. Like what? 
Like the fact that you heard the noise and woke up, that you sent your husband downstairs, that you turned on the light behind him and made him a perfect target for whoever held a gun. Johnny, like I... Like the have... fact that you filed your insurance claim less than 24 hours after your husband was killed. Suppose we hear what Shorty Wells has to say before I make any report. What if Shorty dies without talking? Well, in that case, I guess you will be in the clear. Because right now, he's the only lead I've got. Now, if you'll excuse me. Johnny, make that report. Make it now. Sorry. I'll give you $10,000 out of the insurance. Oh, you are anxious, aren't you? I just want to get it settled. Sit down, Johnny, and let's talk Johnny. about it. Yeah, Joe, what is it? Fireman I know just came by the hospital, Johnny. They found out why Shorty fired those shots just before he ran out of the blazing house. Why? That cellar door was padlocked on the outside. He had to shoot the lock off to get out. Then he probably didn't set the fire after all. Not if he was locked in the basement. What about that, Marty? Was he the one who was supposed to die in the fire? If he was hiding out in my cellar, I didn't know anything about it. Just another one of those odd angles, huh? Oh, stop it. Johnny, by the way, uh, what do you want to see me about? See about? What do you mean? Well, yeah, you, the nurse said you phoned the hospital. Said you wanted me to meet you here. You mean you didn't? Come on, Joe, let's get back there. Sure, that's why she wanted me to meet her there, to get me away from that room. Now somebody phoned and got you away. Elevator's coming down now, Johnny. Shorty's the one big threat to whoever's guilty. They know that if he talks, they're tagged. They get up to his room before... Oh, I thought... Mr. Sherman, leaving? Well, yes, somebody phoned. It's the mayor. He wants me to meet him across the street. Anybody up there with Shorty Wells? Well, the doctor will be back in a few moments. Come on, Sherman, back oh, into the... Wait elevator. a minute! Look, I've got to meet Mayor Start it up, Joe. Start right, it up. Six floor, number six. May I ask what's going on here? I haven't got time to go back upstairs. I told you... I'm afraid you you'll I... have to take time, Mr. Sherman. It was all right to leave, Dollar. Shorty wasn't showing any signs of coming to. Did you make sure of that? Did I... Look, Dollar, I, I don't get all what you're right, driving. All right. Come on now, let's go. Would somebody please let me in on this? Let's take a look at Shorty first, Mr. Sherman. Johnny, what happened to the cop who was on duty? Well, he was here in the hall when I left just a moment ago. Oh, he got to walk down to... Did you leave that door ajar, Mr. Sherman? Why, no, no, of course not. Come on, Wait. but quietly. What the devil? Are we interrupting something, Mayor Lyons? Oh, well, well, what's no, he doing I... with that pillow? Uh, nothing, nothing. I, I wasn't doing a thing. You but... were holding it down over Shorty's face. Get out of the way. I think you were trying... Shorty's dead. You smothered him with that pillow. Oh, no, he was he, he was dead when I came in. I was I was just moving the pillow, Dave. Did you have to get us all out of this room and then send the police guard away just to move a pillow? Mr. Dollar, are you suggesting... Well, I'm suggesting have... it for one. Dollar, I've been sure for months that Mayor Lyons was back of the rackets here, but I didn't have any way of proving it. Until now, perhaps. Until now, Mayor. Very well, don't move, any of you. Oh, now, wait a minute. That gun isn't really your answer, Mayor. There are three of us, you know. You can't get us all. Stay back, Dollar. Tell me something. Why did you have Ed Blake killed? Wasn't he one of your own boys? I can tell you why. Now, Ed Blake was going to pull out of the racket, Dollar, and spill the whole setup to me. That was the reason for that fishing trip. Then it must have been Marty who tipped off May Alliance. Sure, sure, it figures. She loved that racket money that Ed was bringing home, and Shorty Wells was in town with a grudge against Ed already. Well, it was real convenient for you, wasn't it, Mayor? As a matter of fact, Dave, it was very convenient. Then Shorty hid out in the cellar of Marty's house until she decided things would be less complicated if she locked the cellar door and burned the house down. Marty was a weak link, you might say. She... Stay back, Dave. Oh, you better give me the gun now, Mayor. No! Get back! Do what he says, Mayor. You haven't a chance. I'm warning you, Dollar, if you try... Yeah, to... I hear you. But I doubt if you can... Let go of it, Mayor. Drop that gun. Let go of it. No! Thanks. No, if Look you out, just... he's getting away. Lock the door. You'll never stop me for a... Look out, that window. He tripped. Oh. That's... That's six floors down. Yeah. Well, he got out of being prosecuted. As a matter of fact... There's nobody left to prosecute. You want a bet? Uh, 
She was still sitting there in the lunchroom across the street from the hospital. And she'd heard what had happened. I knew it the second Dave and I walked in from the half-smile of triumph on her face and from the way she greeted me. Too bad, Johnny. You should have taken my offer because I don't need your help now. Your company is going to have to pay off. I'm really in the clear now. You are, huh? And poor Dave, with nobody left to prosecute. He still has you, Marty. Accomplice to your husband's murder. Uh-uh, Johnny. Shorty died without talking. Mayor Lyons is dead. No witnesses, no case. Sorry, Marty. There is a witness. Oh? Who? You. What are you talking about? What's that paper? Well, you intended it to be an insurance claim. But actually, it's more of a confession. Signed and witnessed. What? You were over-anxious, Marty. And you filled it out in complete detail. It says, We found my husband's body at the foot of the stairs. That's right. That he'd been shot and killed with his own gun. Well, it's true, isn't it? That's what happened. Yeah. But this claim was in the main office of the insurance company less than 24 hours after your husband was killed. The police didn't find out he'd been shot with his own gun until two days later. Real neat confession, huh, Marty? Expense account item 12, $310.45. Incidentals in Greensport and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $516.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Marty Blake never was able to explain how she knew about that gun. She sure tried. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's a very gratifying experience. It's encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And, well, we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Next week... A yacht that wasn't there, and a man who wasn't there. They never were, but that's where I found them. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is written by Les Crutchfield and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Tatum, Paul Dubov, Joseph Kern, Stacey Harris, and Russell Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Kearns, Johnny. Great Plains Guarantee. Oh, hi, Ralph. Johnny, you're 52 years old. I am? Eight months ago, you married a lovely 27-year-old girl. Now I'm with you. A month later, you took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on a chief of police's salary. I did, huh? And who did I name as beneficiary? Your beautiful wife. Who else? So? 
So three days ago, you were shot to death. Eh, I had a feeling it wasn't going to last. And 24 hours later, your wife files a claim on the policy. My friends tried to warn me she was fast. Well, there's the setup. What do you think? The same thing you probably do. In that case, you got just 56 minutes to catch the plane. The town is Greensport, Missouri. And watch yourself. What do you mean? From what I hear, Johnny, it's a wide open town. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the open town matter. Item one, $84.60, transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greensport and taxi to the townhouse hotel. I was hoping for a chance to shower and change, look around long enough to get my bearings and then edge into the case gradually. But it didn't work out that way. The case was already there and waiting for me right in the lobby of the hotel. All dressed up in a shiny black suit, squeaky black shoes, and a neater than neat little black bow tie. Oh, am I glad to see you, Mr. Dollar. Are you? Oh, indeed, yes, I am. I just breathed a great big sigh. Relief, you know, when I heard you tell the clerk your name. That's how I know you're you, you know. You mean there's been some doubt? But of course you'll want to know I'm me, so I... I'll swear I had a card in one of these pockets. Well, uh, maybe you could just tell me who you are, Mr. Uh... Uh, Potzer, Averill P. Potzer. I ought to have a card, though, to make it more official. Oh, never mind. I believe you. I must have given them all away. Don't worry, though. I'll get some more printed and see that you have one before you leave. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Potts. Here, and oh, now oh, oh, wait, Mr. Dollar. You want to talk to me, of course. Will I? Yes. I'm the agent here for the Great Plains Guarantee Company. I'm the one that sold that policy to the fellow that's dead. Oh, so that's it. Of course. <laughs> he wasn't dead then, you understand. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Feeling pretty lively, as a matter of fact, but with a new young wife and all that. I imagine so. But now, uh, just Mr. Dollar... Uh, You've got to do something about that woman. Oh? Oh, she's driving me crazy. She wants her money, she says. $50,000. And she seems to think I'm carrying it around in my pocket. She's, uh, kind of anxious, huh? I'll tell you how anxious. Chief Blake was shot about two in the morning. And at three that afternoon, Marty, that's Mrs. Blake, was down at my office after a claim form. Yeah, I understand it was sent airmail special delivery. But she insisted on it. Made me take it straight to the post office as soon as she'd signed it. Pretty cold-blooded about it, huh? <laughs> Well, I've heard Marty Blake called a lot of different things in this town at different times, but never cold-blooded. <laughs> you follow me? I, uh, think I'm ahead of you. You'll know what I mean, all right, when you meet her. I can hardly wait. Man, oh, man, wow. <laughs> Item two, a dollar and fifteen cents taxi to the suburban home of Edgar Blake, former chief of police of Greensport, now deceased. On the strength of Potzer's description of the widow, I added a shave to the shower and change, and I hoped I looked a little fresher than I felt. The house was a rambling two-story job set back from the street. Well-kept shrubbery, nice lawn, quiet neighborhood, and plenty expensive. I wondered how Blake had been able to afford it. I was halfway up the walk when a man came out the front door. He wavered down the steps, then stopped and waited for me, rocking slightly on his heels. A copper. I can tell him a block away. You're a copper, right? Wrong. Private eye, maybe? No. Nope. Insurance investigator. Insurance. That's what I just asked her about. And you know what she did? Oh, threw you out, probably. Right. Said I was drunk. Oh, ridiculous. That's exactly what I said. Ridiculous, I told her. Ridiculous. But you know something? She was right, I am. No. I can hardly believe it. Well, it's a fact, though. At least a little bit. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. This is Dave Sherman, Mr. Dollar, city attorney. Oh, yes. I've been trying to reach you, Mr. Sherman. Yes, so my office tells me. It's the uh, Ed Blake case, I suppose. That's right. Well, I've already told my secretary to make all the records available. It's not the records I'm mainly interested in, Mr. Sherman. I want to talk to you personally. Oh, why? Because I've been informed that you're able to furnish an alibi for my number one suspect. Marty Blake, huh? That's right. Who informed you, Mr. Dollar? Marty Blake. Oh, the lovely widow herself. Right. Well, I guess we'd better have a talk. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes, if you're dead set on lighting a fuse in this town, I may as well give you some matches. Come on over to the courthouse. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri. To the Home Office, Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Items 5 and 6, 70 cents, a copy of the Greensport Daily Herald and the taxi fare to City Hall. I opened the paper and glanced over the headlines. Murder of police chief still unsolved. City Attorney's Office claims new evidence. Mayor Lyons demands action. I could feel for the mayor. My client stood to lose $50,000, life insurance payable to the dead police chief's widow, Marty Blake. So I wanted action, too. And I was hoping to get it from City Attorney Dave Sherman. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have a seat. Thanks. Why did you get in town? Oh, uh, early this afternoon. And you've already met Marty Blake. Well, that figures. Yes, it does. Under the circumstances, her husband has been killed. He carried $50,000 worth of insurance with my company. And Mrs. Blake filed her claim less than 24 hours after his death. So that's why you hot-footed it out here from Hartford, huh? Well, uh, the company figured 24 hours was pretty fast action for a grief-stricken widow. Oh? I don't imagine Marty is grieving too much. No, she's not. She told me that herself. Mm-hmm. Marty's about 26 or 7. Ed Blake was in his 50s. Uh-huh. Money, maybe? Well, not until he met her. Then he started to make it. Fast. He had to. That's how Marty likes things. Fast. And then he married her. Well, then she married him. Mm. And now, eight months later, she's a widow. With an insurance claim for $50,000. Well, she said she liked things fast. Why, oh, uh... I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you may as well back up and start all over. You're off on the wrong foot. Oh, how do you mean? This killing? Oh, sure. It worked out perfect for her and made to order. A man could build a pretty good case against her, especially with that 24-hour insurance claim. Yes, that would really cinch it with a jury. I pointed that out to her. Uh-huh. I, I figured as much. Would you mind telling me what happened? Well, her first move was to start uh, turning on the charm. <laughs> That's one of the easiest things she does, if she thinks it might pay off. And after all, with $50,000 in the office... Sure. Did she give you any of the details of, you know, of the uh, night it happened? It uh, bored her to death to even talk about it. Uh Oh. And you thought she was putting on an act to uh, maybe throw you off? What would you think? Oh, she wasn't, Mr. Dollar, any more than she was sorry that Ed Blake was murdered. Then she's pretty cold-blooded. Well, that's a moot question. Figuratively, yes, I suppose she is. See, she used to be a dancer. Never good enough to make the big time, so she had to, well, live by her wits and her charm. But uh, you pointed out things that could look pretty black for her if the case ever got to court. That's right. Uh, What happened? She sent me to you. Why? So I could tell you she didn't kill him. Well, it adds up, Mr. Sherman. I know. It was late at night, the two of them alone in the house, her husband shot to death with his own gun. I know, Mr. Dollar, but not by her. Why not? That story about the mysterious prowler has been used before, over and over. Matter of fact, I broke one of them not six months ago. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's true. How do you know? Because you were wrong on one point. They weren't alone in the house. What do you mean? Who else was there? I was. Oh, I see. Mm Hmm. 
She's as pure as the driven snow. Well, at least so far as Blake's murder is concerned. Yeah, kind of a neat setup, isn't it? Huh? Instead of prosecuting attorney, you're the star witness for the defense. Mm, yes, I... I suppose if it came to that, I'd have to be. I was there when it happened. So that's why she sent me to you, so I could hear it straight from the horse's mouth. That's about it. Well, she couldn't have a much better alibi than the city attorney himself. Thank you. Well, she's in the clear, Mr. Dollar. How did you happen to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning? I was spending the night. Ed and I were planning to leave early on a fishing trip. Oh, I see. Like to tell me all about it? Certainly. Certainly we'd uh, all gone to bed around midnight. It was uh, oh, a few minutes before 2, I woke up. I heard Marty and Ed out in the hall just outside my room. I opened my door, and just then, Marty snapped on the hall lights. A second later, the shots blasted downstairs, five quick ones. Where was she standing at the time? By the door of her room, not ten feet away from me. So you see, Mr. Dollar, she couldn't have done it. Uh, so, that's that. She can thank her lucky stars you were there. Oh, Marty's always been lucky. Have you known her a long time? Three or four years. Ever since she came here to Greensport. You and Blake were pretty good friends, I suppose, huh? No. No, as a matter of fact, we didn't have too much use for each other. Oh? Oh, I know it doesn't make sense, going fishing together and spending the night in his home, but... Well, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. Do you? Yes, you're thinking maybe I need an alibi as much as Marty does. Well, it is that kind of an alibi. It works equally well for either of you two. Yeah, only I don't need an alibi. Blake and I had our little differences, that's true, but they weren't serious enough to be a motive for killing him. Maybe Marty herself could be a motive. In what way? How old are you, Mr. Sherman? Thirty-three. Why? And Marty Blake is twenty-seven. And a beautiful girl. Her husband was around fifty-two, I believe. Uh, wrong guess again, Mr. Dollar. I've known her too long, and what's more important, I know her too well. Meaning? Well, sure, she's a knockout. Uh, I was nuts about her once. She's a... Uh... Ah, uh, summer night, wild honeysuckle and a handful of stars, but there's one great big catch to it. And that is? She's got a built-in jukebox, hidden way inside of her, and when you put in money, it plays real pretty music. When you don't, nothing. Ed Blake found out. And still went on putting in money? Yeah, he liked the music. And that's why he got mixed up in the rackets. Well, police chief's salary was... Well, well, Mr. Dollar, you do get around, don't you? Was Blake running them or just taking orders? Now, what makes you think there are any rackets here? Maybe it was just a guess. Oh, who told you about them? <laughs> it's funny, I can't seem to remember at the moment. I just bet you can't. Suppose you answer my question, Mr. Sherman. Who's behind the rackets here in Greensport? Uh, just a minute. Who did Blake get his orders from? Or was he the one who gave you... Oh, wait orders? a minute, Mr. Dollar. Just take it easy. I'll... Steve, I wonder if you'd mind going over that report on... Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't know you had... No, that's all right, Bill. Come on in. This is Johnny Dollar. The Dollar's Mayor Lyons. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar's an insurance investigator, Will. He's here to look into Ed Blake's death. Terrible tragedy, Mr. Dollar. We'll appreciate all the help you can give us. Well, so far, Mayor, I'm afraid that doesn't amount to very much. The only theory I had just blew up in my face. Oh? What was his theory? Oh, Mr. Dollar suspected Marty Blake of the killing. Well, Dave, didn't you tell him that you... Yes, were... yes, he told me, Mayor... That's when it blew up in my face. Well, at various times in the past, Mrs. Blake might have been, um, as one might say, a bit indiscreet. But to consider her capable of cold-blooded murder is utterly unthinkable, sir. Particularly. My name's Crayley, Joe Crayley. I'm a reporter. Greensport Daily Herald. Shiny dollar. Hiya, Joe. Insurance, huh? And he did have some. Well, you wouldn't have had any reason to be here. She was lying. No comment. Who's a beneficiary? Uh, still no comment. It's her, of course. Little smarty Marty. His ever-level little wife. How much is she going to make on the deal? Uh, sorry, Joe. I... No comments. All right, let her lay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell me something, Joe. Uh, suppose I want a little action. Want to get into a poker game while I'm here. Find a craft table, maybe. Any idea where I could go? Sure. Anyone a half a dozen different... <laughs> How long you been in town, Johnny? Mm, about an hour. You wised up pretty fast, didn't you? Well, I didn't know it was a secret. The town is wide open, isn't it? It is. But I wouldn't go around poking into things if I were you. A guy could get hurt, you see what I mean? Maybe a guy did get hurt. Blake, you mean? What makes you think so? Well, if somebody wanted to keep the rackets going, the police chief would be a natural target, wouldn't he? Not necessarily. Meaning? No comment. 
What was Blake's salary, Joe? Six thousand a year. On six thousand, he was living in a house like this. Well, you see, Marty, she's even more expensive. So that's why Greensport is wide open. The police chief was in. No comment. Mm. Well, he's out now, that's for sure. Uh, Joe, I'll probably be talking to you later. So yeah, I'll... yeah, do that. Just ask anybody. Joe Craley, the alcoholic that works for the Herald. I'm always around somewhere. Well, how do you do? This is Blake. Yes, what can I do? Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the insurance company. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Come this way. I'm a little surprised, really. I hardly expected them to pay off so promptly. Well, in that case, you won't be too disappointed. Disappointed? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't come here to pay you anything. Then why did you come? I'm a special investigator, Mrs. Blake. What does that mean? The company would like a little more information about your husband's death. I told them all about it in the claim I sent to them. I know, but sometimes oh, it's necessary. that's the pitch. They're trying to squirm out of it. Why do you say that? Because they sent you here, that's why. And because they always do. I know how those companies operate. Oh, you've had experience with them before. No, I haven't. But I'm a real smart girl, Mr. Dollar. And I know a fast shuffle when I see it coming. And a smart girl ought to know better than to yell before she's hurt. Why else would they send out a special investigator? I told you why. They want some more information. What information? What is it they want to know? The details, that's all exactly how your husband was killed. I told them all that in the claim. I know. He was shot to death with his own gun right here in his own house. Do you mind showing me how it happened? Oh, for the love of... Now, look, there won't be any payment until I file my report, Mrs. Blake. All right. You win. When you go after something, you really go after it, don't you? Well, that's what I get paid for. Oh. And what about something you personally wanted? Well, that would depend on how bad I wanted it. I see. Would you like a drink? No, 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 thanks. You won't mind if I have one. Right ahead. Looking at you. Right. Now, uh, if you wouldn't mind... Yeah, I know. Stick to business. All right, come on. Happened over here, by the stairway. Mm -hmm. I see. Right here. This is where he fell. This is where he died. His gun was lying on the floor beside him. Middle of the night, wasn't it? About two in the morning, we'd been asleep. Why did he come downstairs? I heard a noise of some kind. It woke me up. I shook Ed and told him about it, and he came down to see what it was. He was armed? No. His gun was there on the hall table by the front door. Is that where he usually left it? Yes. Whenever he came home, he always took it off and put it there on the table. Then anyone who knew him would probably know they could find it there. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So, uh, what happened? Well, like I said, Ed went on downstairs, and I walked out of the bedroom into the hall. Were there any lights on? Well, not down here. I turned on the hall light upstairs. Did you hear your husband say anything? No, all I heard was the shots, four or five of them. Then I heard someone run out the front door. And what did you do? I called out to Ed, but he didn't answer. Then I ran downstairs and found him lying here, dead. Did you get a look at the prowler or whoever it was? No, it was too dark. And he ran out as soon as he fired the shot. How did he get into the house? The detective said he forced the lock on the front door. I guess that was the sound that woke me up. And then he used a gun that was inside the house that he may or may not have known was inside the house. That's what the police figure. All right. What do you figure, Mrs. Blake? The same thing, I guess. I don't know any more about it than they do. Well, I thought you might have some theory of your own. I'll string along with them. Uh-huh. Just an accidental prowler who got panicky and snatched up a gun that happened to be lying around handy. I guess that's about it. Any idea at all who the prowler might have been? Of course not. Do you suppose it could have been somebody besides a prowler? Somebody who came here for the express purpose of murdering your husband? Oh. And had a lot of enemies, of course, because of his job. What about his friends, Mrs. Blake? What do you mean? Do you suppose one of his friends could have done it? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been admiring your watch. Hmm, real nice. Set in diamonds, emerald band. 
Must be worth around $2,000. Very nice. Well, thank you. And this house, the furniture, that car out there in the driveway. On a police chief's salary, Mrs. Blake. I... I wouldn't know anything about Ed's financial affairs. Who runs the rackets here in Greensport? What rackets, Mr. Dollar? Was your husband in on them? Sure you won't have that drink? All right, Mrs. Blake, play it your way. I thought the insurance company was probably convinced that I was the one who killed him. They're not convinced of anything yet. But they think I did it, don't they? No, but they think 24 hours is pretty fast for a grief-stricken widow to shoot a claimant to the office. I am not grief-stricken, Mr. Dollar. So I noticed. Do I have to be? Is there some clause in the policy? No, you don't have to be. You think I did it, don't you? I think there's a strong chance you did. Then I think you need a little straightening out. I'll listen. Uh Uh-uh. Why should I make it easy for you? Go see Dave Sherman. Talk to him. Dave Sherman? The city attorney. See what he says before you get all lathered up. See if he thinks I'm guilty. All right, I will. And then we'll talk. And if you're nice enough to me, maybe I'll even cooperate. You never know. Do you? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's very gratifying, gratifying encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Tomorrow, a smash in the teeth opens things up and an airtight alibi gets air-conditioned with bullets. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dunn. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>